This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of Medium 2014, an interview with Mark Fisher, founder and CEO of uh, Syncs Exchange and Sync Summit. DMT's coverage is brought to you by CI, the leading provider of digital delivery services to the independent community on ci-info.com. So hi Mark, it's great to be here at Medium and great to have you on. Thanks for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, let's talk about uh, Sync Summit. Uh, when did it start? What is it? And, and uh, uh, what is the story of it? Okay, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a very brief background, or at least I'll try to. <laughs> Basically, for me, about two years ago, I, I've, I've done a lot of things in music, and uh, I wanted to um, really develop a licensing business. Right. Basically, like Sync Exchange, my other business, is a brokerage between buyers and sellers of music for visual and interactive media. As part of this, uh, I have... Um, I've gone to a lot of conferences, as a lot of people do, and I found that for business-to-business -business purposes, a lot of conferences fall short because they basically do one of two things. They provide very basic, what I would consider 101 information, which means um, you know stuff like how do I fill out a brief, how do I get my music to a music supervisor, very basic information, and that's great. But you know, if you are in the business, you already are past that. And then the other thing is uh, events and meet them is great, as well, but it's like an event where you have like Lee R. Cohen talking on a very high level about very big deals, and that is actually really interesting. Or somebody like, you know, Hans Zimmer speaking about a uh, soundtrack that he wrote again, very high level stuff, or that you know, the people that work with him wrote it, and you know, that's great. And we include those sorts of things, both the high and the low, in our event too. But the whole idea of Sync Summit was to create an event that I would want to go to. And that means like, you know, if I'm an editor, uh, a publisher, if I'm a um, label or a library or an artist that's had some success in sync, uh, I want to go there already with some experience and knowledge. Basically, I want to go there to do deals, to network with people and meet people that I haven't. And on the music supervisor side, I don't want to be in a situation where it's not productive for me. You know, music supervisors will come in and of course, you know, a lot of the people I know are gracious and wonderful and they will come in and they'll speak at an event. But a lot of the time, I think that event organizers are at fault because they don't organize the uh, networking opportunities in a manner that makes the music supervisors feel comfortable. Like they'll have, you know, basically a lot of pitching and it tires out the people and they don't want to come back. So what we try to do is we try to make it more casual so that uh, between the uh, panels, the workshops and um, the um, showcases, as well as the conversations, um, there's as many opportunities for people to network as possible before, during and after the show. And it's done in a way where you balance out the access to the music supervisors with, uh, you know, not being too taxing of their time and, and their, their effort. Yeah, Essentially, it's about getting everybody in the room that is interested in the same thing and get them to talk to one another, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you know, one thing that is true is that music supervisors are truly interested in music. You know, they, they, they love music. They are basically like walking encyclopedias, okay? And they always want to get new stuff. They always want to pull in something new and then they want to be able to get it out to somebody else. But at the same time, they also have a job to do and there's very few of them who have real impact. So, you know, you're talking about people who get between 100 and 1,000 emails a day. And, you know, if you're trying to get a song into a particular show, um, you know, it, 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 the, the way that you, there are certain ways and means to do it, um, but there's nothing better than being able to actually go and make a casual connection and then follow up. And there's absolutely no guarantee that anything's going to come of that, but at least you've made a real connection instead of trying to just shoot an email to somebody who doesn't know you, doesn't know about you, and doesn't have the time, frankly, to go through your email. Yeah. So the, the event started in the States, you did an event in New York and one in LA, yes. and now you're moving into Europe. So how, how, how did that come about and how does that differ from the usual event that you do? Well, that's a good question. I mean, look, uh, we did the first event in New York because it was sort of low-hanging fruit for us. We did it at Soho House and, you know, we, we wanted to have something that was nice and intimate. Uh, and then the LA one was just an expansion of that. And uh, we had some really serious people speaking at that. I was very grateful for their participation. You know, people like Thomas Globich from Breaking Bad and Matthew Knowles, uh, Beyonce's uh, dad and former manager, Terry McBride who managed Fun, and on and on. We have had really great high-level speakers. Now, in terms of the attendees, what we found with the attendees is other than the networking and learning from people, 
uh, you know, we have a contingent of people, a large contingent, who come in from outside of the U.S. to the events. And um, it was really a decision for us whether we were going to do something. We were going to do something in Europe, but whether or not we were going to do it in Paris or London. And basically, when my British friends told me to do it in Paris, I thought, well, that works because, you know, that was sort of the thing I was waiting on. Uh, you know, London obviously has a lot of huge advantages for sync, but also, you know, Paris is a great place to bring people in from all over Europe and really make something that's a good mix of the European uh, business alongside Americans who are uh, active in the European market, bringing them together so that, you know, hopefully we can do some business and we can talk about, you know, the differences in the marketplace. So that's really it. You know, it, it's like sync is a global by its definition, because if you think about visual media, you know, all visual media, whether it's a video game, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's TV or film or, or, or advertising, um, all of these things are international. Maybe you could say that to some degree, pub, uh, you know, uh, advertising is a little less international depending on the brand or depending on the, you know, the purpose. But in the larger sense, you know, television gets syndicated. Uh, cinema, uh, you know, is, is global by nature. So all of these things have to be thought out on a global basis. And maybe you have to make some changes locally. But when you talk about the process and you talk about the creative, at the end of the day, there are differences. And these differences have to be taken into account. And hopefully, we can illuminate some of those differences as well as bring together people to make the business more efficient and to help people to do more business. And uh, so the sync business is uh, really, uh, has, it's always been big, but uh, it's become a particular focus of the music industry, of course, in an era where it's difficult to make ends meet and artists are always looking for new sources of revenue. So are you finding that this is also generating more interest from artists themselves and managers of artists to attend uh, the summit? Yeah, well, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a little bit of a story. One of my friends is one of the founders of Devo, and I interviewed him a couple years ago for Billboard, and we were talking about sync. And what... They were always, they were always, even in the early days, they were ready to like sync everything. And, you know, his partner, Mark Mothersbaugh, uh, Mark writes uh, scores for uh, a lot of uh, film, very successful in that area. So when I spoke to him, I was like, you know, Jerry, tell me what the uh, sort of, you know, trajectory has been for you guys in terms of sync. And his answer to me was, well, you know, the labels and us, we thought about it as an afterthought, you know, more than something that was at the forefront. But... As the market evolved, it became more and more important for us as a band, not just as a revenue source, but also it's a way to keep keep their name out there. And it doesn't matter whether you're a really successful band or you're, you know, somebody who's just getting started. Sync has a myriad of things that it can bring you. And revenue is only one component because if you use it correctly, depending on the opportunities that present themselves, Sync can also lead to endorsement, it can also lead to promotional deals, but more importantly, a sync event by itself, if you have something in a film or you have something in a TV series, these things can be leveraged to promote other things that you're doing, whether it's a tour, whether it's new merchandise, whether it's a new single, all of these things can be connected to each other through your social media, through your mailing list, through your live events, so that at the end of the day, you know, when you... Um, when you have a sink, that sink is able to help propel you. And, you know, when you look at it from a monetary perspective, it's really cool, you know, if you get like a few thousand dollars or even more than that for doing a sink. But where the real opportunity is, especially if you're working with brands, but I think this really goes with everything, is that if you have a sink and um, it's uh, a commercial then you're also being advertised. It's not, just, it's not just the product or the brand. You are also part of that budget. So, you know, if you have a marketing budget, I'm talking about a bigger artist now, you have a marketing budget of like a million dollars from your uh, label. Well, that's great. However, if you do a deal with L'Oreal, uh, they have a $50 million budget worldwide and they're going to put your commercial out there and people are going to see it again and again and again and again. And that helps to drive your sales, even if they don't put the information about 
about the actual song, people can Shazam it or people can find the song. And that's amazing. And the same thing works if you're talking about cinema, if you're talking about television, if you're talking about video games. Like a lot of the things that happen right now in terms of releases, and this goes for big artists, but it's also good for smaller ones, is that, you know, Bruce Springsteen, he put out his new album alongside um, having syncs within shows. And he's done that, not just this one, but other ones. Um, a lot of artists, uh, uh, Eminem's another one, Eminem, uh, Call of Duty, uh, Call of Duty 2 got together. I think it's Call of Duty 2, I may be wrong, but um, it was one of the Call of Duty series, uh, used uh, one of his songs um, in the um, commercial, but also it was in the soundtrack. And it was concurrent with the launch of his, uh, I think it was Mar uh, Marshall Mathers album too. And um, that's really smart because that's a game that sold a billion dollars worldwide and has an enormous marketing budget attached to it. And again, even if you're not Eminem, even if you're an artist that gets a sync that's in some you know, television series for a minute, you know, you can really benefit from the promotional value so, I mean, that's that's where I see the real interest for artists. Like, artists are like, oh, this is a good payday, right? But it's more than that. And that's what we try to say to people is that it's more than that. It's a fulcrum for everything you do. It needs to become a branding. Uh, it, it needs to involve the wider brand that you're involved, that you're dealing with. Essentially, you know, if you, if you get offered a sync from any brand, really, yeah. the conversation has to be not just how much you're going to pay me, but, you know, where is this advert going to go? Can I tie this in with my release? Uh, is there anything that I can do for the brand to help promote my bands somewhat? Exactly right. Exactly right. And that's that's the thing. When you're structuring a deal for a sync, you shouldn't just say, okay, I just want to get a payday. Now the music supervisor may say that's all you're gonna get. We're not gonna put a you know, we're not gonna put any advertising, you know, or publicity behind this because it's about the product or it's about the creative. But you should always ask for it because, you know. A lot of the time, they're amenable. If you bring your costs down a little bit, they'll give you some promotion. And I think that you know you have to have some intelligent people working with you in order to know what that balance is. But it's worth having that conversation because, like I said, if you have a brand like L'Oreal and they're bringing advertising into the picture, you know you're lifted by this enormous budget. But even if you're like dealing with a um, film. Or, you know, like, let's say that your song is used on somewhere like a shopping network every time that they're playing a speaker, you know, that they're trying to sell. Uh, if they put your information in, if they announce it, it might be worth taking your fee down in order to get that publicity because, you know, a big shopping network will be, you know, over millions of people over the course of the uh, campaign. And that you know, is something that you're not going to be able to easily get from your social media. And, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, a brand artist, you're not going to get that from um, your label. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Sync Summit uh, Paris, uh, uh, what are the dates? When is it happening? Sync Summit Paris is on April 14th and 15th. So uh, it's uh, basically uh, going to have a series of um, panels and keynotes uh, with people like... Um, uh, Quentin Tarantino's main uh, music supervisor, Mary Ramos. She does like, she's done a lot of his uh, films, The Django Unchained, and Glorious Bastards, Kill Bill, Volume One and Two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we have uh, the head of uh, music for B Sky B, uh, Peter Bradbury. He's awesome. Uh, we also have uh, the head of music from uh, Ogilvy for the U.S. We've got uh, his counterpart at JWT. We've got a uh, head of music and sound for YNR France and on and on and on. We have a lot of new speakers that are coming up. But again, the whole idea here is that we bring together the right people and get them in the room with people they can do business with. And, you know, the panels and the keynotes, the way that they go, is that we have, a, we have a keynote for 45 minutes or we have a panel for an hour. And then at the end, we have 15 minutes that's devoted exclusively to people to you know, basically get in a line and very quickly introduce themselves, give their product to the uh, music supervisor, and then move on so that they're able to make a connection at the event. And the second thing, is um, we also hold a series of workshops over the two days. And that basically is one hour with one music supervisor and 30 people maximum having a dialogue. That's something that I think brings real value to people. 
Um, in addition to that, before the event, uh, we get the uh, attendees together with, um, at least in email, with uh, the uh, different um, speakers and uh, basically say, okay, here's a profile of someone on the website. Uh, this is uh, this band, this band, this band. And take a look at it if you want. Again, no guarantees, but at least they're getting connected. And then the other thing is we have a series of showcases where, you know, bands can actually get heard. And we really try to have, you know, sort of a good criteria so that we have, you know, good quality music. And that's basically it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And it's uh, singsummit.com. Singsummit.com. Perfect. S-Y-N-C-S-U-M-M-I-T.com. Perfect. So go and check it out. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in the event, definitely uh, worth uh, looking at. And if you can't make the Paris one, I'm sure uh, you'll be able to attend one in the States. Uh, uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Ian. And thanks for listening to the Digital Music Trends coverage of Medium 2014. You can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.